Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and uh, we've got a great show for you today. Uh, we're talking to our first out-of-country guest, Pastor Tobias Riemenschneider. He is in Germany, Frankfurt, Germany, and we're going to be talking about uh, COVID restrictions, government tyranny, what the Christian's responsibility is to that. We're going to learn a little bit about him and how he came to Christ, his family, and uh, just a bunch of other different things that we don't often see here in America. We kind of pay attention to ourselves a lot, even in the church. And um, this will be a good conversation. Pastor Tobias, how you doing, brother? Thank you for having me. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I'll mention, just for the audience, we did have some technical issues earlier. I think they're all ironed out now. Uh, but if there are some skips or hops, he is in Frankfurt. Germany, not Frankfurt, Kentucky, but Frankfurt, Germany. There is, of course, a Frankfurt, Kentucky, and a bunch of other foreign cities like Glasgow and Paris and Goshen and all sorts of other ones. So Lebanon, there's another one. Anyway, fun stuff here in Kentucky, but we like to name, we got all sorts of names in America. Uh, anyway, Pastor Tobias, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, you're married, you got children and all that. Just tell us, tell the audience who you are. Yeah, gladly. So, yeah, uh, as I already mentioned, I'm I'm married. I'm a uh, father of three children. Um, the youngest is one. The oldest is five. And, um, you know, I, I was born into uh, the New Apostolic Church, which is quite big in Germany. It's not so well known in the U.S. There are churches as well, but um, they are big in Germany. And um, this is a false church. So they don't really they don't have the real gospel. Um, they stress very much their apostles. They believe they have living apostles today, and you need these apostles uh, to lay hands on you so you can receive the Holy Spirit, and only they can proclaim the forgiveness of sins. So you need to have the apostles in order to be saved. And I thought I was saved because I had the apostles. I thought I was in the only true church. And, um, and that changed when I... When I visited America, you know, when I was 18, I wanted to see America and I, I stayed with a host family in Wisconsin for six weeks. And they they are the first born again Christians I met in my life. And they challenged my belief. They they took a lot of time to talk with me about the Bible and about what they believed um, to be true. And um, to, to be honest, you know, I, I was very proud back then. I um I didn't really take them seriously. I, I thought they were a little stupid for believing in a six-day creation and so on uh, because we know that's not true, right, because of science. So, uh, yeah, I was very proud. But what they told me and also how they lift out their faith, um, you know, that stuck with me. And uh, because I somehow felt that what they had was better than what I have had. Yeah? So um, th their faith had had power. There really was something behind this faith, um, a power to, to change them, to, to help them uh, live a, a holy life, basically. So um, when I was back in Germany, I, I wanted to experience this sort of faith again. And, and what I did was I, I tried to, uh, to find sermons by American preachers on the internet. And um, when I listened to one sermon of, by Paul Washer, um, that was when I was converted, when I was when I understood that I was not saved, but indeed was on my way to hell. Mm. I, I began to really read the Bible for the first time in my life, really, to read the Bible and, and especially to believe the Bible. Mm. So step by step, I, 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 I believed more and more truth from the Bible and was was changed. But it took me another 13 years till I finally left the New Apostolic Church and okay. found a real a good Bible believing church. Yeah. Which is difficult in Germany to find. It's not so easy. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so how long have you been married? I've been married since 2009, so that's now 13 years. That's Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife and I got we got married in 2007. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so one one and one's your youngest, five's your oldest, you said. Right. That's good. Our youngest right. is, is almost five. We've got a 12 year old, mm -hmm. 12, 10 and six. It's good stuff. Um, yeah, no, that's that. Praise God, brother. I mean, that's it's really something that you hear that time and time again so often. 
uh, where people will think they're in. And I would make the argument that that's that's such a quintessential mark of a cult is Mm -hmm. is uh, this is the true church. This is the true church. In fact, I was having my blood pressure raised and my sanctification um, damaged last night. I was inadvertently got into a Twitter feud with several different Roman Catholics, all from different angles because of this one post. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I've had a few other things and I've got a few Roman Catholics that actually support the channel. And uh, I've I've paid attention a little bit here and there. I did host a debate between a guy who used to be Roman Catholic is now Protestant and one guy who used to be Protestant is now Roman Catholic. And they debated Mm -hmm. and I was the moderator. And I got a lot of good exp- uh, exposure and, and things. and But it, it's fascinating just the, the things that you kind of <clears throat> talk past each other. But one thing that I always hear Roman Catholics say, and I don't hear Protestants say, or just Bible believers, you could say, is, well, this is the true church. You know, Baptists are the true church. Reformed is the true church. Calvinist is the true church. Luther- Lutheran or Presbyterian or, or Congregational or, you know, there's so many different flavors. And of course, somebody like a Roman Catholic might look at that and say, no, oh, see, look at all the division. We're the one true church. Well, I got Church of Christ here, which started in the 19th century. Uh, and I believe, you know, there are probably many believers there. But they say, no, 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 we're the true church. And there's other groups here that say this. Mormons, of course, say, no, no, we're restoring the church. We're the true church. I mean, <laughs> it, just, it goes to show like we all want to be part of something, but it's like the gospel is salvation by grace alone and Christ alone. And so we have these things that you get that. And like you even said, you were in a false church, though you were saved. Uh, and I think, you know, that can be the argument for a lot of people that maybe even in a Mormon church. Now, I don't want to go out on a limb, but there are certain things that somebody might be in Christ, but they're so clouded or calloused or or, you know, like you said, it took 13 years to really get pulled out of that. Uh, but eventually you, you need to be out of that because, you know, I think at one point you're, you're, you know, you're, you're sinning or there's, there's, you know, you're bringing reproach and, and that's just, that's not good. So right. anyway, um, not to rabbit trail on that too much, but yeah, we've got, uh, oh, you want to add something? Yeah. You know, when, when, when you, when you grow in the knowledge of Christ, there comes the point where you cannot stay in a false church. Right. Um, so even though it took me 13 years, these 13 years that the pressure built up. Yeah. So it got worse and worse um, un- until I finally just couldn't stay anymore. Right. So and I believe that is what will happen to everyone uh, who is, is really saved and, and believe the Bible. Right. Um, yeah, no, that's that's a good. And again, the distinction is you're not saved in the church, like, say, Roman Catholic. Catholics would say, at least some, uh, or other groups like the Mormons would say that you, you have to be in this church. It's like, I don't, I don't say that about the Baptist church. I, uh, pastor, you know, you have to be a Southern Baptist. You have to be a Baptist. You have to be in this church, but there are groups even still that call themselves Baptists <laughs> that you have to be. And if you're not, then you're going to hell, blah, blah, blah. And all these things, <clears throat> they, they instantly become these works based type thing, or there's this contingency. You know, maybe you're not saved by works. A lot of people, oh, no, no, we're not saved by works, but we're kept by works. You know, they'll, they'll say that. And it's like, well, so Paul's writing, you believe this part, but you don't believe the spirit over here. I mean, it's just, yeah. Anyway, I mean, Galatians is, Galatians is so helpful. Hebrews is so helpful. It's, it's, but yeah, again, you have to know the scripture and knowing the scripture. We know the word, we know the Lord. Um, yeah. Um, right. I appreciate you sharing that. So, let's kind of get into the meat of uh, the discussion. 2020 was bonkers, right? And there's still some people floating around that pretend like, you know, it's April, 2020 and not nearly 2023, but that's in their own head. Most people have moved on from masks. Most people have moved on from social distancing and, you know, slathering themselves with basically alcohol in in the, uh, the hand sanitizer and all that. And, and and realizing like, I think we were lied to. I I think, I think we were kind of, I think a lot of this was is 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 a farce. Now, sure, people got sick. I get it, but I think you know more and more and more people are realizing, um, especially with with places and things here in America. But you all in Germany, you had a different experience, I would say, to a degree. Um, talk a little bit about how the Christians should engage, because you're one of the three authors to the Frankfurt Declaration. So similar, this is one of the uh, a declaration similar to at least for the audience, the Nashville statement on biblical sexuality or the Dallas statement or the Chicago statement from, uh, I would at least argue, maybe you might say otherwise, but the Chicago statement in 1978 on biblical inerrancy. 
Uh, talk a little bit about just the Christian's responsibility to the government and um, just kind of help us form it out because we've, I think we've heard some of the arguments and we've might have either forgotten it or realized, okay, yeah, that's good. But who's to say this can't happen again? And it seems like there's certain parts, especially even in, in the Netherlands or in Canada, that they're still pushing a different agenda, but it's still the same tactic, still the same plays. So talk a little bit about that and uh, our role toward the government. Yeah, and, and actually um, in Germany, we are still not out of COVID. So we still have mask mandates and public transportation um, when you go to the doctors or to the hospital. So we no. still have mask mandates in place, even though it's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's much better than it was in 2020 or 2021. Okay. But um, yeah, so you know, this was a unique situation for for you know most of us never had to really think through these issues. Um, what should we do when the government comes and tells you um, your church has to close down, or as as it was in Germany, you are not allowed to sing for seven months. Um, or you have to social distance and so on and so forth. So what what if the what what if the uh, the state interferes with your church and your church service and your relationships to your brothers and sisters? What should what should you do? How should you react? And we didn't really had had to tackle this issue for decades, um, but now it now we do. And um, you already mentioned that. I, I believe we will also have to do that in the future. Um, maybe it will not be COVID, maybe it will be something else. But I believe that the state has shown its true faith, face. And, um, and we will see more of this totalitarian, author authoritarian state in the future. So it, it is a really important um, uh, issue to think through. What should the Christian response be to mandates by the state which interfere with um, worship? And, um, you know, it, I think maybe the, the starting point is um, that Jesus said we, we ought to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But many people um, don't, don't read on because then it says, and to God what belongs to God, right? So, and we should be more concerned with giving to God what belongs to God. Right. Um, that is the most that is the more important part of this uh, so um we have to figure out what belongs to god and cannot be given to caesar mm. and i would argue worship belongs to god singing praises belongs to god loving your brother and sister and showing them your face yeah showing them um, nearness yeah um those are th things which belong to god and not to caesar um, the, the ordinances, yeah, uh, the Lord's Supper, baptisms, mm. uh, all of this was 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 forbidden in Germany. So, um, mm. do these th things belong to Caesar, and we can just give them to him, or do they belong to God, and we have to protect them from the overreach of Caesar? Mm -hmm. And I think it's obvious that the latter is the case, right? Those things belong to God, right? And there is our our you know there is the line. Um, we, we cannot give to Caesar what belongs to God. So it is very easy. Of course, you can go in depth. You can go into Romans 13. And, um, but it all basically says the same. If, if Caesar stays within his authority as a servant of God, praising what is good and, um, you know, and punishing what is evil, if Caesar acts like that, perfect, obey him, yeah? <laughs> submit to him. But if Caesar doesn't do that anymore, if, if, if Caesar wants you to do something which is evil or prohibits you from doing some th something which is good, like having church services, right, um, then you have to, um, you, you cannot submit. You have, you have to resist. Mm -hmm. yeah? I, I would even say you have to resist. I don't think it's, it's, it's optional. I yeah. think you have to resist. Like John Knox said, right, um, resistance um, to tyranny is, is obedience to God. So, right. um, so and, and, and we had to think these issues through and, and we drafted the Frankfurt Declaration to help Christians, to help the church thinking through this. So where, where are the, the, the boundaries of Caesar's authority? Um, not only with regard to the church, 
but also with regard to the family. We believe in these three spheres of authority, yeah? the church, the state, uh, the, the, the state, and the family. And what many Christians today believe, because we don't have a biblical worldview, uh, is that the state is above the church mm-hmm. and is above the family. And that's just not true. Um, the state has its realm, the family and the church have their realms, mm-hmm. and uh, the state is not above all. Christ is above all. Yeah? Amen. And so um, those are the issues to think through, and I hope that the Frankfurt Declaration helps to think through these issues. Yeah. Let me, I'll switch over to it real quick. We'll just look at it. Yeah. Um, and I, I encourage everybody to, uh, to sign it, to read it, and if it makes sense to you, to, of course, to sign it. Um, let's see here at the stream. There we go. Uh, so this is it here. Everybody can find the Frankfurt declaration.com. Those who are listening and not watching, uh, it's on here. You can read it. it says in the course of human events, it sometimes become necessary to people of good faith to speak out against the abuse of power. Uh, very, very professionally done. It's in multiple different languages and, uh, I've already signed it. Many people have, in fact, there's a lot of people. I wanted to ask you this. It wasn't on on the question originally, but I'm always curious. I mean, you, there's a lot. We got Bodhi Bakum, Tom Buck, a lot of people that people would recognize. Uh, James Coates, Jeff Durbin, um, several others. Phil Johns, of course, MacArthur's on here. There's MacArthur. And, but I don't see others. There's, you know, there's a lot of uh, MacArthur's guys, as it were, there's a lot of Doug Wilson, you know, Canon press, there's Ben Merkel, of course, Doug Wilson signed it and, uh, and others, several of the Canadian pastors, Joel Webb, he's got a big YouTube channel presence there. Um, what, how does this work exactly? I'm always kind of curious. Did you ask like everybody? I mean, I, I know there's not some like big Eva mailing list or, or something, but I don't think Russell Moore and some of the Tim Keller's are going to sign this, but I'm talking about some of the other um, still confessional or evangelical convictional guys that people would know. Did you guys, did, I mean, ha, I'm just curious, how did it work? Did you, right. did you send out an email or multiple emails or what, what, what's the deal? It's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, there were a few um, articles um, when the Frankfurt Declaration came out and some of them were very critical. And um, a few times people said, well, I see El Mola didn't sign it. So why, Mm -hmm. what's going on there? And um, well, what's going on there is that I probably did it quite unprofessionally. (laughs) because (laughs) You you mentioned the the Nashville statement and others. My yeah. understanding is that these statements, um, you know, the, they were done by um, dozens or even hundreds of pastors coming together, working on this and then releasing it. And mm-hmm. um, that's now not how we did it. You know, we were three guys, one from France, one from South Africa, one from Germany. And uh, we met on the Internet and we we did this declaration and we didn't know if anyone would be interested in uh, in what we were putting together there, um, and we did not have the um, the support of of, of uh, Big Eva or whatsoever. So we were just these three guys working on this declaration, and um, and then when when we were almost done, we contacted a few of our friends, um, James White, for example, or Joe Boot and James Coase and others, yeah. and asked them for their input. Yeah. So um, and but then I just asked. Um, the guys I knew, would you like to sign it? You know, yeah. I'm, I'm a friend of, uh, of James White. So I asked James White, do you want to sign it? I'm a friend of, uh, of James Coates. So I asked him. And, and I reached out to a few other guys, which I, um, I, I didn't know personally, mm-hmm. but only maybe a handful. Um, and even, even MacArthur, you know, I, I have a friend who is, um, who is in, in Mac, at MacArthur's church who works there and, he was able to get through to him. So, but it was basically me and my my few connections and friendships I have um, uh, in, in in the United States. Gotcha. It was okay. yeah. So it was not this process which was really organized and professionally done and um, <laughs> just contacting basically everyone. I just contacted the guys I knew. I just contacted my friends. Gotcha. And um, so. I apologize uh, to Al Mola or anyone else who, yeah. uh, who who maybe thinks why was I not contacted, but there's nothing really behind it. Just that I 
I didn't do it professionally as you, you probably should have done it. Sure. But I just contacted my, my friends. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's, and it's funny because so often you'll get, it's like with so many things in life where you think it's going to be this way, or you think it's like that. And then you ask a question or you go talk to that person about Christ, or you go to the interview or you do the thing or, you know, maybe before dating, you ask the girl out and you're like, oh, she said yes. You know, like, at least if you're like me, there's so often we think the worst, even though I feel like I'm a glasses half full kind of guy, there's still, ah, oh, it's, it's probably that. It's probably some conspiracy. And you realize, oh, it's just, it's just like what you said. You know, they didn't ask everybody and he doesn't right. know everybody. He's not on, you know, bigeva.com. And therefore, you know, you, it didn't go out to thousands of, of people. So. Um, and we never, we never, you know, we never thought it would it, the the Franco Declaration would be so so well received. Mm -hmm. I I didn't think that MacArthur would sign it, or or yeah. So so it, um, it, I was surprised that almost almost everyone I contacted said I will sign it. Yeah. So we never thought it would be it would get that that much attention. Yeah. Cool. No, that's good. Uh, and of course they can still sign it now, but I know I know some people might be a little unnerved i can't speak for anybody else but there's a lot of german pastors i mean it, it goes i mean down to canada or up to canada and of course south africa cyprus um australia there's there's a lot that's it's it's very robust as far as those who have signed it and uh both original signers and then notable signers and so on so i'd encourage everyone who's listening go to their frankfortdeclaration.com and read it and uh, sign it i'm sure those who are listening already have a, a, a deep suspicion about the government and want to stand on uh, the truth and be organized. And this is a good way to do that. So um, thank you again for, for that, Pastor Toby. Um, or Tobias, I guess you, you go by Tobias generally, right? Or is it Toby? Both is fine. Either way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some people call me rich. I usually do Richard. Uh, yeah. All right. So again, we kind of talked about it a little bit with Romans 13. And I, I pulled up Romans 13 and I want to I don't want to say push back, but let's let's dig a slightly deeper into it and say, so we'll read it here. Um, Biblehub.com, one of my favorites. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those who have existed are, have it been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger of, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of you, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes, revenue to, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Uh, we could go on, but uh, I think some people read the first few verses. And I know some people think this, not because I'm a mind reader, but I don't know, I, I just, People are different, right? Not everybody has the exact same line of thinking, even as, you know, confessional evangelicals or I love Jesus people and we love the word. People still go in different directions and think, yeah, but what about this? So somebody might read this and say, yeah, Pastor Tobias, but I mean, it says here for no authorities except from God and those who have existed exist have been instituted by God. So they're going to say right off the bat, this has been instituted by God, the tyrannical government of of germany of south africa of america of canada these are instituted by god because well they're here what what do you answer to that person yeah so uh, uh, first of all th that's true um in general we have to be subject to submit to governments even if it is a tyrannical government it doesn't say subject only to the good governments but subject to yourself mm -hmm. to, to so and, and the first reason that is given is because every authority is, is given by God, is instituted by God. Mm -hmm. So that is the first reason. And uh, this is a valid reason. Uh, but it goes on, you know. And mm -hmm. 
True. If you have a tyrannical government, if you have a, a, an evil anti-Christian government, this is instituted by God. Um, but then it goes on. It, it, you know, th there is another, um, another reason given. Um, and that is what the government is, is doing or is supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Because the government is supposed to act as a servant of God, um, punishing evil and, um, and uh, promoting good or mm -hmm. praising good. Right. And, and, and if you go through these verses, you see these, uh, this pair uh, again and again, good and evil or good and bad. You see that all the time, the wrongdoers. And you don't have to fear the government if, if, you're, if you're doing what is good. You have to fear them if, if you do what is bad. So now Paul is talking several, in several verses about this good and bad, good and mm. bad. So that is the rationale behind this. Yes, every government has received its power and authority from God, even a bad, even a tyrannical government. But why should you submit? And um, you should submit not only because the government has authority and has this sort, but also because of your conscience. And what does co the conscience do? Well, it differentiates between good and bad. Mm. And that's what it's about. So if the government asks you to do something which is good, you have to obey. Not just because it's the government and they have the sword to punish you if you don't, but because it's good. Mm -hmm. Your conscience tells you do what is good. And on the other hand, if the government tells you to, to do something which is bad, you cannot do it because your conscience is against it. So and what is good and bad is not decided by the government, but is mm. decided by God. So that's a good point. He gave his law. Yeah. He, he tells us what, what is good and bad. Yeah. And so if the government is acting as it is ought to, ought, ought to act, yeah, like a servant of God, then there is no problem at all for a Christian to submit. Mm -hmm. But if the, if the government begins to, to, you know, to call good evil and evil good, uh, then we cannot submit because right. then we would act against what is good. And we promote what is evil. We cannot do that. Our conscience is against it because the law of God is against it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good distinction. And I think I think that's something that, again, as 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 followers of Christ, we are called to renew our minds. We're called to walk. We're called to put on the armor of God. We're called to not walk in the flesh, but walk in the spirit. We're called to do all these different things. And I think sometimes we're so. I don't, I don't want to say utilitarian, but maybe that's a good word. Oh, and, and just very black and white. Like it's either th all of this or it's all of this. And it's not like any sort of like nuance to say this is this way because of this. And this is an outpouring of this. I mean, this is the argument, as I mentioned ago, I won't go back into it. But even I think with a lot of Roman Catholicism, they they see us as like anti or or um ah roman catholic like opposite roman catholic where this other church and we joined a church that was started by luther which we could you know talk about especially being there in germany but like we, no it's we're going back to the bible we're looking at the scripture you know i had a guy last night talk to me about oh you you're part of a church that was started by john smith in 1602 and it's like yeah i know church history i know most people don't sure but i do and no i don't john smith has zero authority over me i believe in believers baptism because of this i believe in congregational worship and governance because of this that's why not because of john smith <laughs> like but they they don't see and so i think there's just like all or nothing for a lot of christians even evangelicals in america and the west we all we gotta obey and like what you said it's as if the government's over everything else when in reality the government's just a different sphere and these things overlap like a you know like a venn diagram i would imagine right. uh, probably the best way to look at it but like not singing well what about the admonition in ephesians I think it's Ephesians, songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Yeah. How are we supposed to do that if we're told, and California did this too, yeah, you can't sing, oh, the droplets, the this, the that. And it's like, <laughs> uh, well, this is part of my worship. And, you know, that's, that's we're, no, the answer is no. Sorry, government, we're not going to not sing. We're not going to practice, not practice the Lord's Supper and so on. And um, yeah, I, I think it, in everything else, you have to take it as a whole. I mean, Again, I say this often, there's no chapter breaks, there's no verse breaks either. And I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice. I know we do 
we do ourselves a disservice when we read just a verse or two or three. And I just read seven. And that's not even the flow of the whole coming off of, you know, Romans one, Romans three, Romans five, Romans eight, Romans nine, 10 and 11. Of course, Romans 12. And this whole letter. Well, there was no Romans 13 or Romans nine when Paul wrote. He's just this one letter to this Roman church. These are the things I need from you. This is the thing that you should see from Christ. This is who he is. This is who you are. Here's the problems. It's the whole thing. And when we don't study the scripture, when we're not preaching through it, we're not memorizing, we're not, we're not uh, understanding it. We get into all sorts of trouble. And maybe just to add something, you know, um, we are not the first ones who have to tackle these problems, right? right. So th there is a history. There's a church history. And if you see that Romans 13 was misused in this way also in, in, in the Third Reich yeah, during the Nazi regime. Mm, yeah. They did the same thing. Well, Roman 13 tells you to submit, so just submit. No, that's not all Romans 13 tells you. It also gives you a, a reason. It gives you a rationale. And you have to think these things through. And it, it, it's a very shallow um, exegesis of Romans 13 just to say, well, it says submit, so that's everything it says. It's not, right? Right. And, and again, the point of, that you mentioned, too, is of, of a good government. So it doesn't say, well, submit if they're good. However, there is the flip side of it. Well, and it seems like Paul, what Paul's argument is, at least kind of just looking at it um, right now, is that he really is talking about when you're doing something evil, you, you of course, expect to be punished. If you steal something, you know, I mean, Proverbs talks about this feeding, but you got to repay and, you know, feeding your family, but you still have to repay it there's all these instances that well dude you broke the law like you were speeding of course you're going to get a ticket like that's that's how this works but it seems paul's making a distinction between almost i don't want to say trivial but uh just normal quote-unquote law breaking versus hey my government's now tyrannical and they're imposing these draconian rules that they weren't doing before and now what do we do? Well, I guess the government says we can't, so I guess we can't. No, they're now calling evil good and good evil. And what does the scripture say? Woe to those who do that. Right. And that, that's something that, that I think we need to have the whole package of yeah. and not just part of it. You know, and if, if the government punishes you, um, Romans 13 says, well, it's acting as, as an avenger carrying out God's wrath. Mm. Is that really the case if, the, if they are punishing you for something good? For example, if, during the Nazi regime, if, if, you, you know, if you protect Jews, you hide them from the government. Well, if the government finds out, they will punish you. They will kill you. Yeah. So are they carrying out the wrath of God against you for trying to protect Jews? Mm -hmm. Of course not. That is not the wrath of God. That is an, uh, that is an evil government uh, perverting uh, righteousness right yeah. so you don't have to be afraid of them they can still kill you but you don't have to be afraid of them because they are not acting as an avenger carrying out the wrath of god if they act like that mm -hmm. yeah no that's good i think that's i mean not to get into it uh because that's not the subject but even with the american you know war for independence revolutionary war and so many of these other instances that's not just here but it's been throughout history and like you mentioned with even john knox a moment ago and others mm -hmm. that we also live in a fallen world, man. The world, the flesh, and the devil <laughs> assail us, and and the world is fallen. Christ is king, but there's also work to do. There's still responsibilities that He has given us uh, as image bearers and co-laborers, etc. And so, I think sometimes, like you said, that's it hits a nail on the head. It's just a shallow, uh, shallow understanding of it. Um, I guess make the distinction then, just for us though, because again, some people might just swing the other way and say, "Well, I don't." then I don't need to have permits. I don't need to have building codes, fire codes, you know, the kitchen. We're just going to, we're going to have a kitchen. I don't care about the health inspector to come in just to give a once, once look over and make their little check marks. You know, what's the difference, Pastor Tobias? What's, what, where does this work with saying a church building or even a business, right? Yeah, I'm a Christian. This is my business. I'm going to do it however I want. I don't care about the health code. I don't care about cleanliness or or I'll, I'll clean it this way where does where does that line go yeah so the general rule is you have to submit okay um you don't have you, you don't have and you are not allowed actually to submit when the government is asking you basically to sin you have to do something bad or right. to not do something which is good so um 
and and you know there are, there are even some things which are more or less neutral you know m maybe maybe there is a street sign telling you you're only allowed to go 50 here well maybe you think well, i could easily go 70 or 80 yeah well but but this this is morally neutral right mm -hmm. so just just submit Right. You have no right to, to with a Bible in the, yeah, with, with, to come with a Bible and say, well, no, this would be a sin for me. It would not. So just admit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, it's my religion. I need to speed. I need to go fast yeah. everywhere I go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So and but, but there is a a fundamental difference between things like fire codes or yeah, whatsoever and um, and what we saw during COVID mm -hmm. because. You know, if, if, if the state requires you to build in an, an extra emergency exit, um, this is not a, a direct influence, you know, not, not uh, exercising direct influence on the, the worship, the content or the, 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 the mode, the, 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 just the way you're worshiping. Mm -hmm. It might have some indirect effects. So maybe if you have to build a new emergency exit into your church, maybe there will be three seats less. Mm -hmm. Okay, that can have an, an indirect influence on your worship, probably. Um, but but the, the main the main problem during COVID was that the ch that the state directly tried to have influence on um, on, on the worship. Mm -hmm. So um, they told you you are not allowed to worship at all, or you are allowed to worship, but only with. 50% or 20% of, of the people. Or you are allowed to, to worship but not to sing. And you're not allowed to have the Lord's Supper and so on. So mm -hmm. these are th those mandates are directly... Um, you know, Caesar is trying to exercise direct influence on the church and uh, on, on, on the practice of the church, on worship. And there he's overstepping um, his authorities. And we have to, to resist him. Okay. Um, it, you can argue it, it is part of, of Caesar's authority to take care of building permits and fire codes and so on. Um, but it, it's not part of his, uh, of his authority to tell us whether we are allowed to worship or how we can worship or with how many people we can worship. Yeah. So I think that that's a fundamental, uh, fundamental distinction there. Is something having maybe only an indirect influence or is it having direct influence? Yeah. No, that's good. Um, I appreciate that. Talk a little bit about, um, so you have, so several of the guys, I think it's Jacob Riom, uh, uh, James Coates, and um, I don't know if, did Tim Stevens also sign the, the document? Yeah. Also a pastor, he was also arrested. Right. Uh, were there pastors? I mean, I know Canada's, again, they're pretty crazy, at least according to us Americans. Um were, were pastors being arrested, uh, Christians being arrested in Germany there as well? No, no. Okay. Um, That's good. Yeah, because it was, you know, um, there, there were instances where, um, where, where a worship service was uh, shut down by the police and, uh, and, and where people had to pay fines, pastors okay. had to pay fines. But, but this is... This is nothing compared to what what was going on in in Canada, you know. Yeah. Um, Jacob Riom, uh, his church has fines of uh, I think of sixty million Canadian dollars. <laughs> so we were talking about a few thousand euros, probably. Yeah. yeah. So um, no one went to jail. There were some fines, but mm, yeah, a few thousand uh, euros and not a few million uh, wow. dollars, right? So. Yeah, that's crazy. So you so you were in a conference recently up in Canada. Why don't you talk a little bit about that and who you saw and, and what you guys were doing up there? Yes, I was at the Church at War conference okay. uh, in, in Canada, in Waterloo, Ontario. And um, oh yeah, you know, I, I was invited by Jacob Riom, uh, the pastor of Trinity Bible Chapel, who organized the conference. And, um, you know, he, he was so, so gracious and, and so generous. Um, they they offered to and they also did yeah say they they paid for for the hotel um i they paid for the conference fee so i didn't have to pay anything mm. um so they were so gracious to me and um it was really great to be there i was extremely encouraged 
Um, Pat, Jacob Riom was there, James Coates was there, um, Tim Stevens, um, Steve Richardson was excommunicated uh, for having church services, yeah. um, Aaron Rock, and and some others. So uh, basic, basically, basically all the pastors who stood faithfully during mm. COVID, right? They all came together to, to, uh, for this conference. And, um, and, and it was extremely encouraging for me because in, in Germany, um, you know, I, I feel a little isolated in Germany because um, e even though there are other pastors who, who, who oppose COVID, um, I'm still a little too radical for them. <laughs> um, but but the thing the things I'm saying are exactly the same things the brothers in in, in Canada are saying, okay. or our brothers in the U.S. are saying. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying something more radical than you are saying, but for for Germans this is a little too much probably. Yeah, mm. uh, we don't really like to. We like to be very nice and gentle, and um... so does Canada. Can Canadians are too nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, right. uh, which I I, I want to pause or not stop, but that's so strange to me. Again, as an American, I've been I, I was able to go to um, Europe with my wife before we had kids, 2009, and we made our way to Munich, which was amazing, and uh, also Bacharach or Bacharach. Mm -hmm. It's I think it's kind of say it with a thicker accent, um, but it was on the Rhine right, right there, really really beautiful. But I would imagine that there would be such a sensitivity to because I'm, and maybe you can discuss this a little bit if you want, but with Nazism and just fascism in general and just the overall totalitarian craziness of the 1930s into the 40s, that there would still be such a resistance to government tyranny. And, and you're saying that's not really the case. We just want to be nice. I mean, wasn't that the, wasn't that what got you all in trouble to begin with? I mean, yeah, but, but you know, actually, it's <laughs> um, crazy. Yeah, you know, Germans really like to obey the government. We like to submit to the states. Uh, we are real okay. status, you know. It, even okay. even even before the, the Nazis, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, there was Prussia. The Prussians were known to be very to be real status, yeah, to mm. to like to obey and to do yeah, what the government. Yeah, not us Americans. Were. We're not we're not big fans. It, it, exactly, it's totally different <laughs> in America. Yeah. Uh. Um. So and you know what? Basically, what happened? Um, you know, everyone would tell you now that the Nazis were bad. Mm -hmm. But what we did not learn is um, that we should not be statists. Mm. So, I mean, wow. back, back then it was the Nazi regime. Today it's another regime. But we are basically doing the same thing again. Um, yeah, it's not the Nazis this time, it's, but it's also anti-Christian. Yeah, it's also evil. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is, you know... That is what, what Germany and probably many other countries, also many other Christians are lacking, is this biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. So really, um, really understand everything which is going on in the light of scripture. But so many, you know, we are so influenced by, by, um, by the world and, and the worldly worldview. Mm -hmm. We really think the state is above all when it's not. We think yeah. we have to obey the state. We are statists, yeah? And we have to unlearn that. And I don't think that ever happened in Germany. Uh, we just switched to being um, obedient to the one regime, to being obedient to another regime, yeah? Mm -hmm. But we didn't learn that, um, that we should, from time to time, uh, question our obedience, at least, at least make sure that it is not an unconditional, unlimited obedience, yeah? yeah. Because that only belongs to God and not to any state. Hmm. Yeah, so you guys, I mean, I guess, again, just maybe get into a little bit of German uh, life or politics or whatever. I mean, it's a parliamentary government, correct? Yeah. Okay. And and homeschool is against the law. That's illegal, yeah. right? But you can have Christian private schools, though. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, why is homeschool illegal? Do you know? Well, it, it, uh, it goes back to Hitler. <laughs> he made it illegal. <laughs> yeah. And Hitler for made homeschool illegal. Yeah, and they, he and they still keep it on the books. Wow. Right. And I mean, it's for obvious reasons. Yeah. Because if you want to have a totalitarian state, if you have your state religion, your state ideology, you have to make sure that your, um, you know, that your your people uh, is on your side, that they believe what you what you want them to believe, mm. um, that they are good subjects. Yeah. So, and of course, a a regime like the Nazi regime, they want the children 
they want to educate them so they don't they don't get get crazy ideas maybe thinking of opposing the government no right. they have to be indoctrinated as early as possible mm. and um and we still have that and you know there there are some our chancellor he said he wants to have uh, the authority over the children's baths so well, that's how, how we how the, we said it their yeah? baths like b a t h like baths. how they bathe. B, 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 e d b e d oh, oh okay over the baths still that's, that's a, just that's just as crazy <laughs> yeah what what he means is i want to get your children as early as possible yeah wow. um so th this thinking is still there and um and m many christians probably most christians uh, again they don't have this biblical worldview they would agree that the state should take care of education right because the state can do it and we mm -hmm. can't so homeschooling is not a good idea you need yeah. professionals yeah you need trained teachers trained by the state um so th they are competent not the, not the parents so um most most christians even will still think like that um yeah because the biblical worldview is missing right yeah wow yeah. No, that's helpful. Um, I think I kind of stopped you in the middle of the conference. You want to add anything else to the to Canadian conference you were just at recently? Yeah. So maybe what I can say, you know, I, I, I um, when I came, uh, when, when, yeah, when, when I came to Canada, um, I was quite discouraged because of things which were going on here. You know, we had a conference, and I, I. Um, I, I, I spoke at the conference and I said that some of the pastors um, during COVID who, you know, who just believed everything and went along with everything, complied with everything. And instead of protecting the sheep, they even turned against the sheep and told them, well, you're not wearing a mask. You're not allowed to worship with us anymore. You're basically not part of the church anymore. Right. So and if they did all, all this and they did not repent, then you should think of leaving this church because mm -hmm. your pastor is probably not a good pastor. He's probably a hireling, yeah. Because that's the description Jesus gives of a hireling. Yeah. yeah? When when danger comes, when when the wolves come, uh, they don't protect the sheep. But uh, so, um, and and this was really a scandal in <clears throat> Germany, and um, and I was really discouraged because I thought almost no one. Of course, there are a few, but almost no one is. Um, is, is, is with me on this, but they are all criticizing me. And, um, and then I went to Canada and, um, and I was so encouraged by the brothers there. Mm. I was able to spend quite, a few, quite some time with them and I saw the like-mindedness. And, and they did not have any problem with me saying that some of those pastors are hirelings. Mm. Uh, they even said, uh, <laughs> that, wow. you know, they, they said those pastors made themselves servants of Antichrist. So they mm. even went further than me. Yeah? So, but it was so encouraging for me to get out of Germany and get together with so many good pastors, good brothers um, who think alike yeah. and who encouraged me greatly. So I, I came discouraged and I left extremely encouraged. Um, and, and I believe and I hope that the relationships I was able to build, that they will help me, um, you know, that, that they will probably carry me through, um, even though when I feel maybe alone and isolated in Germany, I now have so many friends in Canada, in the US, so I hope they will continue to encourage me. So I will be yeah. able to do the work here uh, because I'm encouraged by my friends from Canada and the US. And Yeah, no, praise God. That's good. It's there's not there's nothing like being in good fellowship. There really yeah. isn't. I mean, it just it's so especially when you're battered and worn. I think that's one thing if I can say out loud that I I struggle with here. Not that I don't have good fellowship, but everybody's very more or less Christian in in the South Midwest. Kentucky's kind of an interesting both Southern and Midwest state, depending on where you are in the rest of the country. You might look at it as more of the South versus more of the Midwest, but. And it's, you know, there are blessings to that. I'm thankful, I guess, in some respects, but there's other respects that everybody goes to church, quote unquote, everybody's a Christian, quote unquote. And so it makes evangelism and, and, and even zeal and passion a little more difficult, at least that's for me, because I'm originally from California, where if you're a Christian, well, then you're probably a Christian. And if you're, you're not going to wander around and say you're a Christian, especially in 2022, or we moved in 20, 2013 uh, to Kentucky from, from California. But even then, you're not going to generally say, unless you grew up loosely in a Christian house, you're like, oh, I'm a Christian. 
And it's like, oh, you are. Well, what are your pronouns? What is this? Do you affirm gay marriage? Do you affirm baby killing? Do you affirm this? Da, 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 da. What about an open border? What about free stuff? Uh, uh, no, actually, I'm not a Christian. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, people, there, there's no cultural capital or very, very little uh, than there was, say, 50 or 80 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 challenging here, but there's nothing like good fellowship that you have. Yes. And to know that uh, to be have the Lord remind you through different ways that, yeah, you're on the right path. Exactly. Tobias, right. you're on the right path. Don't worry about it, brother. I know it's it's dark and it's hard and this and this, uh, but you're on the right path. Uh, right. You, you right. told me a story. I guess we can just wrap up with this unless you want to add anything else. Uh, you told me a story. Was this at the church in Canada of the, the elderly man who apologized publicly? Oh, yes. That yeah, right? yeah. Tell, tell that yeah. story a little bit. Oh, that was so encouraging for me because, you know, I was um, I was um, exhorted by, I think, four or five times in Germany by by elderly brothers. And uh, they said, well, you have to listen to us because we are older. We have more life experience and you should learn from us to mm -hmm. to speak. Well, to, to just be nicer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're Germans, Tobias. We're Germans. Yes, exactly. Even though our language sounds like we're yelling when we're speaking German. At yeah, least it does to, to Americans, nice. but anyway. <laughs> sorry, right, sorry. So and um and I mean this argument is, is totally wrong from the start. It's um right. it's it's um it's a logical fallacy, it's an atominum argument, it's uh, it's not a biblical argument. Um the Bible actually says that that you can be wiser. Than, than the old uh, uh, yeah. when, when, you, when you listen to the word of God. So it, it, it's a totally wrong, false argument. But it was, uh, I think, four or five times people told me that, that I should listen to them and learn from, yeah, from wow. them. And, and then I was in Canada and there was this really old elder. I, I'm not sure how, how old he was, but I guess probably, probably around 80 or so. And... Um, he stood in front of everyone at the conference and he said he wants to, um, to repent mm. because he and also the other, the other pastors from his generation, they did not speak up. They did not boldly fight against everything which was happening in their time. Mm. And, and this is basically when all, all, all the chaos we now have uh, started, right? Um, so he wanted to apologize. He wanted to repent of not having been bold enough, not having been not not having been outspoken enough, um, not really having taken having taken up the fight against all the evil things which were starting back then. Mm -hmm. And and he said he is so so grateful to God that God gave him another chance, mm -hmm. and that he could now be courageous during COVID. God. And you know, um, you know, when these other elderly brothers from Germany exhorted me, um, yeah, I knew I knew they were wrong. But this this old brother, this this elder, you know, I I I, I went to him. I stood in front of him, really, you know, well, almost shaking because I I I had so much respect for him. Mm. Yeah, and. Um, and I told him how grateful I was uh, because that was 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 so true, and that was what I needed to hear. Um, that's exactly what what um, everyone should think about. Not well, I did it. I did it like that for thirty and forty and fifty years. So why don't you learn from me how to do it? Well, maybe you made it. Maybe you did it wrong for forty and fifty years because look where we are now. Maybe yeah. you should have been more courageous. Maybe you have spoken more clearly and not being always so nice. Yeah. And so this was extremely encouraging for me. And I have, I have so I have great, great respect for this elder uh, who in front of everyone was able to to acknowledge that. And yeah, um, yeah I was greatly encouraged. That's great. Praise God. I mean, that's that's such a uh, again, that is an encouragement not to not to repeat exactly what you said, but especially the little tidbit that he said, I'm thankful the Lord gave me another chance. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause you know, God is a God of second chances, right. To kind of be cliched, but it's true. I mean, how often you see the prodigal son the quintessential example of that, but so many other times that you stumble and fall, but Christ doesn't look at you and say, you idiot. Why did you do that? I, come on. 
No, no, my grace is sufficient. <laughs> Get up, let me clean you once again and walk with me. Even if you're laying in the muck, like you said, for 40 or 50 years. And yeah, just because you've been doing it a long time doesn't mean it's right. I mean, in my argument all the time with progress, it's like, fine, progress. But if we're progressing towards a cliff, we should stop and at least not go any further or go the other direction. Right. Just progress for progress sake is nonsense. Uh, yeah. But of course, you know, people want to be progressive. So, yeah. And so I think this shows uh, that that Germany still has a long way to go because Canadians, it seems, at least this brother, but I don't think he's alone. COVID was enough for them mm -hmm. to understand that they have to change. I don't think COVID was enough for Germans to understand they really have to change. I don't think Germans have really woken up. So I believe we are in for some, some, something more and something else until we also finally wake up and, um, and, and be courageous and, um, and, pro and boldly proclaiming uh, the kingdom of Christ, basically. That's what it's about. Right. We have to proclaim that Christ is king. And that, that he is the lawgiver and, and he, he defines what is good and evil. Right. And he will hold everyone, also the president, also the government, he will hold them accountable to his standards. So right. I think we, m many churches just got very private, you know, it's my church. And, uh, uh, but, but they, they forgot that the church has a prophetic voice, that they have to speak to what's happening in culture and in politics. Um, you know, it, It's not okay that that uh, that politicians were able to, you know, to um, legalize abortion, legalize divorce, legalize gay mar marriage, and so on and so forth. And there was not no no real resistance from most churches. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think now now that's exactly what what the elder from Kettle said, right? I think now we are seeing the chaos which has been created, um, and and. The church is in some way, in some way at least, also responsible for that because we did not really fight against it. Right. Which I would then, you know, encourage and admonish every everyone listening that we still have, we're still alive, <laughs> right? And so we still have an opportunity to, you know, we, we're going to judge the world, right? You look at Matt, or, uh, uh, sorry, judge the church, Matthew 18, we're supposed to sharpen each other. You know, God judges the world. So in one sense, yes, we speak to the world, but we can say, hey, you know, the Lord will deal with you. You should repent. This is wrong. But at the end of the day, we're not, you know, responsible for quote unquote, saving the world. But so often at the same time, yes, we make disciples and so on. I get that. But so often we're always worried about the world and how bad the world is. And yet we're not concerned with our own affairs in the sense of how good is our marriage? How good am I being a submissive wife? How good am I being a leader of a husband? How good of a father and a mother am I? A good neighbor? Am I, am I really caring about the person who's next door? Or are they just kind of, you know, they're, uh, that's that old bitter old lady. I don't like her. And it's like, well, are you asking how you can pray for her? Did you make her a meal? Are you going to invite her over for Christmas because she's alone? Or are we just going to be like, ah, I got stuff to do. And I get it. Everybody's busy. But we need to have a richer, deeper faith with Christ, walking with him, but also walking with each other. And that's something that I think we've really missed, especially in America uh, over the last, you know, probably 60, 80 years that they're, like you mentioned, such a privatized. And that's not new. That's just a, oh, that's that's them. No, the world, the hell in a handbasket. And eschatology does play a huge part of that, too. If you think yeah. Jesus is coming tomorrow, the rapture, etc. Okay, even if all that's true, you don't know when it is. But so many people pretended like it was 1988 or 2000 or 2020 or whatever. And they just pretend like, well, I don't really have to do anything. I guess uh, I guess it's over. You know, the movie's over and they're walking out and, <laughs> and there's still lots of movie left. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, anyway. you know, actually, um, eschatology plays a big role. Um, I mean, there, there is a John MacArthur, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and he is a dis dispensationalist and he still stood up. So yeah. um, uh, you, you can still um, fight for what is right, um, even when you're a dispensationalist. But right. um, this was a huge problem in, in, in Germany as well. So many people I talked to during COVID, they, they told me, what well, it's over now. The end is coming. So you don't have to worry because wow. Jesus will, will get, out, get us out of here. And there were even some, you know, when I tried to fight this, you know, I wrote a letter to the government and to the politicians and so on. They even sometimes 
told, told me I should stop doing that. Because what, 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 what am I trying to achieve? Fellow Do Christians I want to hold Jesus back, back, yeah? Do I not want Jesus to come? So um, I, I'm fighting that things get better. No, they have to get worse so Jesus can rapture us. So, mm. um, you know, if your eschatology leads you to that kind of, of thinking and basically just giving up, not even, not even starting any fight, not getting engaged, yeah, but just giving up and say, well, now it's over. Um, I, don't, I think then, then something is wrong with your eschatology. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, brother, you have any last thoughts, any closing, closing comments? I'm going to bring up your church's, uh, the church you pastor's website here in a moment. Um, but any last things you want to mention for the audience? Yeah. Um, I would like to, to, um, to express my, my, my gratitude. You know, I, I'm very thankful uh, for the American church. Um, I know you have many, many issue, issues yourself, of course. There's a yeah. lot, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I, I know pastors from basically all around the world, um, especially Europe. And we look to the, to the, uh, to the American church mm. for guidance. Um, not to every part of the American church, but there are so many good brothers, good teachers, good pastors, um, which are a great blessing, um, I, I believe, for the entire Christian, yeah, for entire Christianity or globally, but also also very much for for Europe, for Germany. So, um, yeah, you're a great encouragement um, for for. Yeah, for basically every Christian on earth. Yeah, so that's really I'm very grateful for for, mm. for these good teachers from America. And um, yeah, I just wanted wanted to let to let you know that we are very grateful for for your service. Well, praise God. Yeah, I mean definitely. Yeah, that's yeah. thanks for saying that. I think because everybody listening could not everybody's from America, but most are. And I think sometimes we can easily be reclusive or think what's the point or it doesn't matter. I'm just a mom with kids or I'm just a dad you know, working at a car dealership or washing dishes or, you know, whatever I'm doing. I'm not quote unquote a pastor. I'm not really doing much, but people who are just quote unquote regular people, uh, you're still Christians and you're still supporting your local church. Love your pastor. Uh, maybe you're called to ministry, you know, vocationally, maybe, but we're all still called to minister. We're all still called to live unto Christ in the, in the realm that he has us. Uh, so that's good. Thank you. I hope that's an encouragement to everybody else listening to. Uh, let me, let me pull up the, your church's website here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's ERB dash Frankfurt with a U Frankfurt dot D E. So ERB dash Frankfurt dot D E. Um, how long you've been pastoring uh, at this church and what's the actual name of it? I'm sorry. Is it yeah. evangelical reform Baptist church? Is that what it is? Yes, exactly. Evangelical okay. reform Baptist church of Frankfurt. Okay. Um, and uh, I've, I've been a pastor since, you know, the, the church was, um, was planted in, or was was officially established in 2016. Okay. Um, and I became a pastor uh, right away, together with my co-pastor Peter Schild, um, right, the one on the top. Oh, right here. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So we've been pastoring the church together now since 2016, but it was only in May of last year that I became a full-time pastor. Okay. I, I I worked as a lawyer before. And, oh, well, and okay. now I'm very grateful I can be a full-time pastor. So, um, and it was the right time, you know, when COVID hit and um, people, they, they, and, and we needed someone who speak, to speak up and, and to think these things through. It was exactly that time when, when God granted it that I could become a full-time pastor and yeah. take on is these it, issues. Yeah. Is this your father here? That is my father. He okay. is a deacon in our church. He's 71 and he's a deacon in our church. Nice. Now, and, and I think, I don't know if you mentioned it beginning or not, but you, so you got saved in, in the mm -hmm. apostolic church, yeah. the apostolic church, and then your parents got saved after. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, that, oh. they did. And th th this was even a greater miracle. Oh yeah. It says it right here. Yeah. Um, age 63 yeah. converted. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Right. He was 63 and it was really difficult for him to, to really get used to the thought that he might, might've been wrong for 63 years. Mm. That was really difficult for him because you know he he was a very success, uh, success successful lawyer and 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 uh, and manager, so his life has been very success, successful. Mm -hmm. And this this thought that he might might have been wrong on a very important issue for sixty three years 
was extremely diff difficult and, and humbling for him. Um, but I'm very grateful that, that, that the Lord was so gracious to, to also save him and save my mother. Yeah. And, um, yeah. No, praise God. Yeah. It's sometimes it's, it's very easy for some quote unquote easy and then very difficult for others. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that, I mean, that's, I mean, what does Jesus say? You know, humble yourself. And, and, and I mean, the tax collector and the Pharisee, and mm -hmm. there's so many instances of that. Uh, and it, but it's difficult. I, it really seems like most people are just like, yeah, no, I'm right. You know, and you're like, are you though? Yeah. You're like, well, I, I can't be wrong. Cause I've been right. I've thought this way for years and years and years. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's yeah. But the Lord's patient, isn't he? So it, it was the word of God, which, um, yeah, which convinced them. They yeah. knew they knew what they were hearing from the word of God. They knew this is true. So wow. they had to submit to it, yeah, even though it was difficult in the beginning. That's good. Yeah. That's good, brother. Well, I appreciate the time. I really do. I hope this was helpful for everyone. Uh, go ahead and, again, check out the frankfurtdeclaration.com. Uh, and, uh, you, of course, you can find Pastor Tobias's website, uh, church's website as well. Where is, are you on social media as well, Twitter and all that, or are you? Have yeah, we, people could find you we are on youtube um facebook and instagram okay. of course almost everything is in german but um may, maybe there are some who can speak german and yeah. Uh, yeah, you're invited to have a look at it. the website translated i'm using chrome on my browser mm -hmm. anyway and the website translated of course it started german but it asked me to look at it in english so i'm able to read it just fine in english of course the default is yeah. german but yeah well everybody check them out and uh if you're curious more and and yeah, this was a great conversation, brother. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, have a great yeah. rest of your day. Thanks, God John. bless.